fantastic. So we have speakers for a panel called How Corporates Can Pivot and Learn from Startups in the IoT Age. And yes, they need to do that, as we all know. So we have a moderator, Yong Yi Kim from the Wall Street Journal. Please join. We have Min Do from GLG, Peter Zapp from Global Sources, Paul Lee from Omeo Audio, and Spencer Fung from Lee and Fung. Please join us. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, so I wanted to start out with a, a topic. Today's panel, um, as you can see here, is old economy versus new economy and how corporations can pivot and learn from startups. Um, one stat that I, I saw that was quite interesting is by 2020, there'll be 26 billion connected devices in the world. And the Internet of Things market, revenue in that market, is, is expected to hit about $1.7 trillion. So there's a huge opportunity here for big companies and small. And um, we have distinguished guests today that can talk about this topic. So it's a real honor and pleasure to be here. I wanted to first introduce our uh, panelists. Uh, to my right is Peter Lee, co-founder of, oh sorry, Paul, Paul Lee, who just won our startup competition. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, you're the co-founder of Omeo. Yes. And uh, you just heard a great presentation from Spencer, group CEO of Van Fung. And we've got um, Peter Zapp, um, who's chief information officer at Global Sources. Um, this is a New York-based, um, I'm oh, sorry, NASDAQ listed business to business media company that facilitates trade with Greater China. And we've got to the far right Min Do, Senior Vice President of GLG, a New York based professional learning platform. So let's start off with the topic of transformation. How do companies transform in an era where everything is connected by the internet? And maybe we can start with Peter first um, and Global Sources. Okay, sure, thanks. You know, I, um, I think the, the issue and kind of what, what we're seeing with startups is as the environment is changing, the types of services we need to provide changes. And we need to think about what are the new services that the, the new environment or the I, IoT companies need. And interestingly, what, one of the things that we're doing is very similar to what the startups do, and that's we're trying to figure out, okay, what's the market need? Um, how can we validate it? Um, how can we go to market with it? And then how can we scale it? Uh, in our case, we're doing that in a more traditional way. We're taking our existing trade shows and adding a section called Startup Launchpad where the startups have an opportunity to then talk to retailers that are coming to the show so they can get purchase orders and generate real revenues, you know, an important part of what a company does. Um, but I think that's kind of what we're trying to do is we're seeing what's going on in the environment, uh, what, how can we support that, and how do we test and validate uh, those market needs. And Spencer, you know, Lee and Fung is a company that's been around you know, over 100, 100 years. years. You are kind of in the thick of the transformation in the, <laughs> in the retail <laughs> industry. Can you talk to us a little bit about how Lee and Fung has transformed this business in the IoT age? Well, we're doing a few things. Um, you know, I think. Uh, in the, in the company, we have a, for example, a combination of using a VC arm to invest in uh, startups, uh, you know, in the tech space and also in the retail space all around the world. So we have uh, an office in Silicon Valley, an office in Hong Kong and London, just looking at different startups. Um, we have um, a lot of uh, corporate corporations with large and actually not just startups, but larger and smaller companies in the IoT space um, to experiment what we can bring to the retailers and to delight the consumers, like what I was talking about. And uh, we also uh, do a lot of, um, we invite a lot of startups to come to the company to pitch their ideas. Uh, so we do these disruptor uh, breakfast and disruptor series where we bring new ideas into the company and let our people actually look at these ideas and critique it and potentially work with them. Um, we also have a, uh, you know, equivalent of a skunk works, if you will, uh, teams working on, you know, ideas that, you know, on the side, sort of, a, of the organization, so um, it doesn't get sort of mixed up into the bureaucracy, uh, into a larger organization. 
So it's, it's a combination of all of these uh, things that we do. And then your company works with uh, you know top global firms. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you're transforming startups and uh, big corporations when it comes to you know, transformation. Yeah, so I think starting from large corporations, there's really two questions here. One is how do corporations stay nimble and have the culture of innovation? And the second question is how do large corporates take the strategic steps in order to get that breakthrough idea? And I think three of the um, key ideas that, that so we see uh, our major clients, Fortune 500, taking are some stuff that's already touched upon. So corporate venture capital is definitely one of the ways that uh, larger corporates can so sort of keep their eyes and ears out. And I think it was mentioned earlier in one of the panels, you know, Intel Capital has really been the market leader here. Uh, they take a very strategic approach to investing, um, very relevant to what's going on today. They currently they're focused on the wearable space. And so they're really pushing that wearables ecosystem. So I, you know, I saw uh, one, uh, an interview of the uh, chairman of Intel Capital um, earlier this week, and they were investing in a company that's doing Seagull, right? Uh, with a heads-up display so you can see where other people are snowboarding around, you know, when you're on the mountains, like where your friends are. And, you know, who would have thought Intel would invest in a ski goal or something, but they're investing in the ecosystem. So that's definitely one way. Um, we, there's other, many other ways we can talk about as well. And Paul, coming from the other side of the spectrum, yeah, the spectrum. Uh, <laughs> what kind of advice do you have as a startup entrepreneur for big companies like uh, you know, Advice is such a loaded word. <laughs> I'm going to share my, my, my learnings. You know. I think, uh, well, first of all, the old, old economy, of the big established companies, I think, uh, are not in any real danger. They have the capital, they have the connections, and establishment. Um, I think what you guys already mentioned, which I think you guys have done quite well, is we just need some people in leadership roles to recognize new things that are emerging. Um, <clears throat> so in my, in my launch of my device, uh, my product, uh, I went through the process of learning about how to launch things uh, with the most effective way with new technologies, for example, crowdfunding and digital marketing. Um, two things that I, I found immensely powerful until I actually did it. Uh, I wasn't really even touching the surface, scratching the surface, just by reading up. Uh, and these are things that can be adopted by, by big companies as well. Um, I'll go deeper into it to stop me because I tend to be talking. Um, so, for example, crowdfunding, we now can just throw an idea out. Hello? Was I not? Okay. Two mics. So, um, now you can actually have an idea. Of course, you need to have a work, working prototype and a team behind it. But before, you have to really gather the, 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 the capital, produce the thing, uh, work on consignment or whatever, and to get it out and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. If it works, you don't really know why. Uh, if it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, but today you can actually throw it out to, to crowdfunding and have people, you know, if the crowdfunding is successful, great. If not, you know it's a bad idea or you can pivot it. You might even ask the people who sign up to pledge for you, what do you think was wrong, right? And even before that, so, so you're kind of shifting the risk to almost the consumer. Um, there's another way, which is digital marketing, which I find was even more powerful. You can even time shift the, the, the risk. So. In a, in, a, in a very small way in our campaign, we were able to tweak our ads because we, when you spend ad money on Facebook, for example, you get to tweak the things, you can change it on, in real time, and you get the stuff very small. And once you find a work that's working, for example, we found a work, an ad that was working in the sense that for every $18 US we put in for the ad, we could sell a device, which was a, over $100. So we found out, oh, hey, this is working for three days. Let's so everything we have at it, and it actually worked. Um, and, and you can actually use the work to tweak for ideas. I, I met a guy which I found very inspiring. He was launching a business that says, um, give me $30. I, I, as, as, as a person, I, I don't want to like cooking. I don't like cleaning, but I, like, I just like eating. So isn't, isn't there a service where I say, I want to spend $20 today, uh, surprise me with food. Uh, this is no such thing. So what he did, was he actually put out Facebook ads out there, tweak it so that, first of all, there's several tasks already. One task is if no one's clicking on the ad, there's no, there's no one but him who wants the service. It's not worth doing. He found enough people clicking on it, and then it, it, it goes to a fake website because it's not a real business yet. And the site says, the site says uh, welcome, uh, let me surprise you with food. 
if you give me your zip code or your, your district. So that's another friction pass. I mean, people have to enter something. So if, pe if enough people enter something, you not only know that people are quite serious about this, you also know where to start. Is it New York? Is it Long Kong or whatnot? And because it is a fake service, uh, the next page after you enter the zip code or the district is going to be, oh, what a surprise. We're not live in your area yet. But if you give me your email address, we'll let you know when we go live. So if even enough people put in the email address, you can now go to the, the Lian phones or the, or the global source and say, hey, I got actual actual data from actual people. And it took me a month with Facebook, maybe $2,000 worth of, of tweaking. That's just going to be people and brain power tweaking it. But the capital-wise, the risk is actually quite low. And, and you can validate the entire thing before you even go live. You even put like real money into, into doing things. So I think this is usable by entrepreneurs, but it's certainly open to the big companies as well. And I think you know, what, what uh, Paul was touching on, on, on the, is connected to what Spencer was mentioning earlier, which is really the data thing that we, we have been, we've been talking about today, which is it used to be in corporations that you didn't have the kind of KPIs and metrics that could drive decision making. And it used to be basically you know, highest ranking person's opinion matters the most. But now, as a business unit, you can generate metrics and drive KPIs that demonstrate your business case very clearly for a corporate to take a step in and push in that direction over time. Can we talk a little bit about how better um, corporations and startups can work together in order to kind of learn from each other in this era? Yeah, maybe I, I can, um, maybe I can talk about our experience, you know, I don't want to generalize, but a lot of companies that we see, especially the larger old economy companies, they cannot generate ideas uh, fast enough. There are many innovative people uh, inside the company, but whenever a new idea comes up, it gets, it gets squashed. Uh, there's a very strong immune system in large corporations that just kills new ideas. Um, on the other hand, lots of entrepreneurs, lots of ideas they can't bring in there. Um, I truly believe there's a symbiotic uh, relationship between the two. Um, but companies, you know, I think different companies have gone through different stages of figuring out, uh, but we're still not there yet. Um, I think, uh, you know, it requires, you know, entrepreneurs actually sitting inside the corporation for a long period of time and each other sort of bouncing ideas on a daily basis, hourly basis, to make it happen. And usually that has to be some work on the side, uh, like the skunk work teams, uh, because once you put it inside the building even, um, you know, the entrepreneurs, even if they want to get a computer, they have to approve it, it takes two weeks. Right? You multiply that by 10 things, the emails, expenses, new ideas, new business plan, and you just slow down the whole thing. And then your competitors would have caught up with you. And this is one thing I was talking about. In Hong Kong, you can iterate so fast. Um, I think that's an advantage where things just move uh, so quickly. Peter, what do you think? Yeah, no, let me, uh, let me add. You know, I think at the, at the beginning of the life cycle, it's critical to be nimble. Right? You want to understand the market, get feedback, prove that your product works. As, you, as a company grows and it has more people, you need to start putting processes and controls in place. And that's kind of what the large organizations are good at. But those processes and controls, they kind of snuff out <laughs> the entrepreneurs. But you know, just for the entrepreneurs, two, um, two interesting stories that I heard recently. Uh, one small company went through an M&A and they had their financials, the revenues. And their salespeople were uh, booking revenues um, but they weren't shipping product. So the liabilities didn't show up in the books. You know, as, as a company owner, as a small company owner, how do you put processes in place to prevent that from happening so that you're not getting duped? Um, second example, an uh, online e-commerce company. So they've got a general manager that has revenue targets. Uh, the general manager is also allowed to source their own product to sell on the e-commerce site. So the general manager sources iPhones, sells them at a discount, it's his revenue targets. Is that good for the business? Probably not. Again, how do you put controls in place to make sure that those kinds of things don't happen? So that's kind of the next step. You know, the first step is great. All the entrepreneurial stuff, get your product out there, make sure it works, uh, make sure there's a market, start with sales. Then you get to kind of the boring process stuff to make sure that the organization operates properly. Man, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think process uh, for large companies, obviously, as Peter mentioned, there to mitigate risk and, and to control sort of any disasters from happening. 
And I think depending on the business you're in, the processes you need in place, like if you're in the healthcare space or the hospital space, you need very strict processes because if you get something wrong, then you know, there are serious consequences. Whereas if you're Netflix and you can, you're in the full-on creative space, you have a lot of, uh, sort of ability to be flexible and to be nimble. And so your goal as a company should be to make sure you have enough process to run the company and scale efficiently, but as little process as possible. So to Spencer's point, you don't stifle ideas. And in terms of letting ideas blossom, it's really about having a culture of innovation. Um, and that means some tactical things. Like for example, if you have engineers working with frontline professionals uh, who face customers, they can, you know, then your feedback loop is, is, is much tighter. But if you don't have that culture of innovation, then it's really, I think, siloing projects, um, allowing these uh, skunk work type teams to sort of run their own, to run their own projects. Like a famous example is Xbox, right? So Xbox was originally designed to run Windows, but eventually it didn't run Windows because they became a standalone team uh, from Microsoft. So various things that you can do, but at, at the core, if you can build a culture of innovation, like obviously some of the leading companies today. I mean, Netflix is getting on as a teenage company. They're not a young company anymore, but they still retain this culture of innovation. Uh, so, so I think if you can retain that culture, then that's great. I think I'd love to add to what Min said. You know, the culture of innovation is not 